Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday, July 8th, and we're doing it from a DFS perspective. I encourage you um, to check out the betting breakdown, which is going to be also, uh, that's going to be coming out probably a little later tonight or tomorrow. It's a very, very interesting DFS slate because you have a whole bunch of favorites with extremely high win probabilities and extremely high inside the distance lines. So much so that the distribution of salary is something you don't see uh, too often. You have an 8,200 8K fight and then nothing between 8,200 and 8,500, which doesn't happen all too often. That 83 and 8,400 range usually is taken. Uh, is taken. But here, we have, you have all these big favorites. You have a 9,800, 9,700, 9,600, 9,400. Um, so... A card like this, it really puts a premium on getting the right underdogs correct. Uh, the also, also the thing I would say is that on a card like this, um, you, you don't have to be as greedy with what your underdogs uh, do for you. I mean, if you can get one of these underdogs to, to come in, that's going to be probably good enough because what's going to happen is it accesses those big ceilings of the $9,500 fighters or $9,300 fighters, et cetera. Um, so it's not too big of a deal how much your, your underdog is going to score on a card like this. Um, they're just so unlikely to win that it really, <laughs> that, that you really, it really doesn't matter too much how they win. Um, so let's, let's analyze it from this perspective. Let's take a look at what some of these uh, inside the distance props are on some of these big favorites. And I'm going to try to make the case that there's, there's not that much difference between these. Um, like for example, like, like Bo Nickel, he's minus, you know, 2 billion, whatever. He is to end the fight in the first round probably is going to be, yeah, like minus 250. Um, and that's just an incredible thing. You know what I mean? So so what you're talking about is about 70% of the time, this guy is going to score 100 points plus. Okay. Now, what's interesting, though, is that his ceiling, ceiling is no higher than some of these other fighters in his range you know if he everything goes his way he gets a first round finish with a takedown and he's between 110 and i don't know one maybe around around 110 unless he somehow gets him out of there literally in the first minute now if he gets him out of there in the first minute then we're up into the 130 135 range um but even at a, with a first round uh, finish, even with a takedown, you're looking at about 110, which is which is really really good. Um, but there are other fighters that are cheaper that you know rate to be competitive for that for that 110 pretty easily, and it also opens up some some salary for you to be able to get some of these more palatable underdogs. Um, now, the next one you look at, let's take a look at, I don't know, um, Jack Della Mag Magdalena. Okay, he is, again, he's a huge favorite to win. And also, inside the distance is extremely strong. I mean, he's, to finish the fight in the first rounds, for example, he is about, again, like minus 200 or so. So, about 65% of the time, we're looking at 100 points plus. Now, Similarly, though, to, to Nickel, his ceiling is right around there, about 110 or so. Now, again, it, could he finish him in the first minute? Yes. So that, that kind of increases his ceiling a little bit. Uh, again, so it's possible he'd get into the 130s, or like about 130 if he gets that first minute bonus. Um, the other bonus that you can get from Jack Della Magdalena that you might not be able to get out of nickel is the knockdown bonus. So if Jack Della gets a knockdown followed by a finish, it makes up for the fact that 
he's not as likely to get a takedown, for example, as as Bo Nickel. So I honestly think that there's not much difference in ceiling between Nickel and Magdalena. The only thing is it's it's, it's probably more likely that that Nickel wins, you know, than it is for for Jack Della to win. Um, um, but with respect to the ceiling, they're very they're very similar. I think that the likelihood of those ceilings happening in the in wins is also very very uh, is also very similar. Um, he's also he's around right, right on the same price ninety seven hundred ninety eight hundred. So both these you know certainly look like good plays. But let's take a look at some of these others who are cheaper. Like so, so look at Cameron Samon for example. He has not quite as good of an inside the distance prop, but it's not bad, right? I mean, look at this. I'm inside the distance minus three hundred. Same in the first rounds. What is that? Uh, about Pickham. I mean, that's not that's not too bad. That is not too bad. Um, not to say the least. And you're saving a decent amount of salary getting from Nickel and De Jack Della down to Simon, right? Um, you compare that one to say, I don't know, uh, uh, Tiara. Again, you have another minus 1,000 favorite, and he is, it's it's kind of almost a rounding error, right? Because he, to win in round one, is like minus 110. So he's very similar to, to Jack Della. So you have all these guys kind of at the top who are obviously really, really likely to win, likely to finish, might be almost favored to win in the first round. So all these guys are very similar. So I don't know if I would want to prioritize one over the other. You know, I don't really want to prioritize Nickel over, say, Tyra or Nickel over, say, uh, Simon or Jack D over Tyra or Simon. Uh, I think they're all very, very similar. The, the one that kind of stands out as not being similar is is um, is Yasmin. Her inside the distance line is significantly lower than the fighters we mentioned. Um, even though you know she does have that minus four hundred win, you know, uh, win equity. Her inside the distance line is not even minus one ten. You know, so she is just much. You know, she is competing with all kinds of ceiling around her. Now, yes, she's going to be the lowest owned of these fighters. So I guess you could argue from a GPP perspective that it's a decent, you know, decent leverage play. But it's just, you just got to, she has to do so much and so much more often than her odds rate for her to do so to really be playable here, I believe. Um, like, even if she does put on a great performance and score 100 points, which she doesn't really tend to do, she still has to sort of outscore like all these guys who are just favored to to outscore her, you know? So it's very, very difficult. Um, then you have Robert Whitaker, who uh, is almost a full fade, right? I mean, you look at him. Robert Whitaker, he is again another minus four hundred. But you look at his inside the distance prop, and you have, I mean, he's minus one hundred five to win inside the distance, but not even, like maybe plus one ten. So you know, comparing him to these other fighters is just, yes, you get a price break, but that's that's it, you know, and and, and it's not as if there's all these great mid range plays to get to that making that salary saving is going to to help the only thing i would say about the whitaker play is that it's possible that his opponent duplicis might end up being somewhat popular as an underdog only because he's been very very volatile and very active so you, people can make the case that he could you know create a pretty big score if in fact he wins so you could argue that whitaker because number one, his inside the distance prop, his internals are not that strong, coupled with the fact that his opponent is probably going to be somewhat popular given his price tag, makes Whit Whitaker kind of a kind of a funky leverage play, sort of. Um, so I, I can definitely see that. But the one who really stands out among all of these, well, we're going to get to Petrino in a second, but we'll, um, is is Volkanovski. So Volkanovski is six hundred cheaper than all of these guys. 
And it's it's kind of an illusion because, well, the illusion is that well, it was inside the distance line isn't the same as these guys, right? I mean, it's it's barely even rated to finish. You know, uh, him inside the distance, for example, is um, it's like plus one seventy or something like that. But the difference is, is that number one, he's got five rounds, and number two, those five rounds are going to be very good to him. You know, he rates to have a good combination of takedowns and volume. That that if this thing does go the five rounds. He has ceiling that eclipses all of these other guys. Like he is the probably the only one of all of these fighters that I mentioned who can legitimately put up 140. You know, now he's not going to put up 140 all the time, and he's not going to put up 140 as often as those other fighters are going to put up 110. But but nonetheless, when you're talking about ceiling and GPP, uh, Volkanovski at, at you know with that 140 point possibility is is. At, at his reduced price relative to everybody else, I think that makes him clearly the best of all of these. Um, now we drop down a little bit though to um, to Petrino. Now Petrino, he is nine uh, k, and you look at his inside the distance line, and it's extremely strong as well. We'll take a look at it, but. Mm, where is it? Oh, Petrino versus uh Rachniao. Uh Petrino inside the distance, like minus 140 for like, and he is you know cheaper than all of these guys. So this is interesting. So I, I actually believe that Petrino is probably along with uh Volkanovsky the two best of all of these nine Ks and ups. Um, you're saving money and you're really not trading in all that much. Um, so those two, I feel are clearly the best. Now, I, I also believe though, that, uh, that they're both gonna, they're both gonna be really popular as a result. Now, I think, listen, I think that Volkanovski is gonna be popular because first of all, he's got, He's cheaper than all these other 9K guys, like I mentioned. And he's a five-round fight, and it's the main event, and everybody wants to play him anyway. You know, he's going to be extremely popular for a good reason. And I think that at the end of the day, I think Petrino is going to just really get pounded here. Um, so with that said, and I'm leading to what I, I think is going to be kind of a hot take here. Uh, one of the very, one of the sharper... Um, MMA touts uh, or content providers. I was having a ch chat with him on Twitter. It wasn't really a chat. I mean, I went back and forth with him just on a couple of things. I was gonna. I wanted to. I wanted to go over some things with him on one of his shows this week, and the scheduling didn't work out. But he asked me, you know, what underdogs am I looking at? And I have to say that given what I just said, and given the need for underdogs and given the need for, for leverage and given also the, the lack of need for a lot of upside, I kind of think Pratch now is going to be my super sneaky GPP play of the week. Um, he's going to be, in my opinion, he's going to be extremely low owned. Uh, if you see his game logs, he, he, Fought the most boring fight of the year to eke out a uh, what was it a draw or a decision against uh, William Knight, and then he's getting KO'd. I mean, there's nothing about this game log that that makes you want to play him, and there's certainly nothing about this game log that makes you want to predict that he has a lot of upside. And not only that, you look at Petrino's last fight in his game log. He's, you're showing seven takedowns and four reversals, and like. I mean, let's just take a look at this. I mean, how do you not play a guy like this on form? You know, it, it's it's seven takedowns, four reversals, and 116 points in a decision. You know what I mean? Uh, so, and, you know, when you don't want to pay up all the way up for these guys, Petrino just looks so perfect. I mean, you look at Pratch now, he, there's just no way you can kind of play him. 
So in a weird way, that makes him probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, underdog DFS play of the week. Um, remember, all I need is a win. Okay? All I need is a win. Because not only are underdog wins tough to come by, but we're getting leverage against what I think is going to be a popular fighter. And if you compare him to some of the other underdogs on the slate, I mean, his his win odds are pretty reasonable at plus 220. Like, you look at some of these others that we talk about here. Um, you know, Yair at plus 300. Yes, he's got five rounds to work with. We'll get to that in a minute. You have Duplessis, who's he's plus 300. You know, it's, he's just less likely to win, you know. And you're not getting any leverage against Whitaker. Then you have... Um, well, Woodburn's like plus a million. I mean, no win, no win, no win odds, right? Harold plus five hundred, no win odds. Gomes is all a plus three hundred, and she is probably going to be more popular because she is coming off of a um uh a finish of her own. So when people are looking for underdogs, they'll see that finish and maybe play her. You know, so um I I think that Pratchnow is is the real sneaky one of all these underdogs. Mitchell is just his win odds are just no good, you know. So um that's the first thing I would say is 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 when analyzing these top plays, I do think that Volkanovsky and Petrino are probably the two best, given everything I've said. But given that that I'm looking for a good underdog for leverage, and given the fact that Petrino's gonna be popular, I would probably fade the Petrino one and and get direct leverage playing Pratchnow in probably more lineups than I'm probably supposed to. Um, uh, and then probably end up getting to some of those other 9K and up fighters just by force, you know, because there's really nobody else that has those types of ceilings. So that's what I would say about that. Um, so let's now go into some of these mid-range fights. Uh, and I guess we'll just start at the bottom here. Well, actually, let's not start at the bottom. Let's, let's, let's since we've been kind of hopping around, let's, Let's state the obvious that, well, there's a couple of obvious things. One is that this 8K 8200 fight between Crute and Menafield rates to be a fight that you're going to want to play because if you're going to want to get to some of these underdogs, these these favorites, you're going to have to give up salary somewhere. And and these 8K $8,200 fights are just perfect in those situations. And so I think that both of these guys are going to be played and for good reason, you know, men of fields, um, they just had this fight. So people just remember how it went. And then you could make your case for either fighter here, you know, men of field almost had crude, kind of knocked out. Oh, wait, hold on one second. Hello. Hey. Uh, sorry about that. So yeah, so Menafield, he had him on the ropes and and he almost knocked him out. So people can see that that variation. And yet Crute had a lot of success with takedowns. Uh, so people can see that variation. So I think that that this fight is going to be you know owned for 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 good reason, you know. And you can make cases for each of these guys, and I would probably play both of these guys. And you look at the inside the distance prop, you see. Um, Menafield inside the distance plus 170, given his price is extremely strong. And Crude, even though his inside the distance line is actually his inside the distance line is pretty strong, also. And he also has takedown upside. So Crude's probably a little bit of a better play, but uh, he's probably going to be a little more popular. So I think that both these guys are really, you know, are, are probably equal with respect to GPPs. And yes, I do think you should play them. Um, is are they going to be too popular? Um, maybe, but I, I think that they're, they're, uh, I, sh- I shudder to say too popular. I mean, the, the need to save salary on this, on this, uh, on this slate cannot be understated because so many of these underdogs have such low win equity, such, so little win equity that to be able to save salary for like pick them fighters is extremely important. Um, Kemwella Kirk versus Esteban Rebovich. Uh, this is he's a minus one forty five, and I keep going back to my baseball line. Here. Um, and according to salaries, we have 
7,700 for Kirk. And why do I have it listed this way? And right. And 8,500 for Rimovich. So no, not a lot of win equity either way. Um, with respect to upside and ceiling and things like that, you have Rebovich, who's inside the distance line is, let's see, it's like plus 120, which is extremely strong, you know? Um, I think, again, given the context of this slate, I think that's uh, that's a pretty strong play. And and yet, on the other side, you have Kamwella Kirk, just, because, just by virtue of the fact that he has decent win odds. I think he's extremely in play. I'm not, I don't even care what his inside the distance prop is, honestly, on a card like this. But even so, it's not terrible. Like plus 350, that's fine. Um, um, so I think that both these guys are, are, are pretty decent. Shannon Ross versus Jesus Aguiar. Um, see, in a vacuum, you have Aguiar is probably a really strong play, right? Because he's only 8,400, I think. Let's see. Um, he's 8,600. And he does have takedown upside, right? I mean, he's he's going to be going for a whole bunch of takedowns. His inside the distance line is, is also pretty, pretty strong. So... Boy, oh boy, I, I wonder if you can get away with this and, and play these mid-rangers like Aguiar and, and Rimovich and not even have to worry about dumpster diving with these 7,200s. Like, if you started your lineup, so we'll get to some others like in, in a minute, but if you started with Aguiar and, who did I say, Rimovich? And now you're 8,200 a man, and that, then you're like also using somebody from the, the men of field fight. You might only have to play like one underdog, and we're going to get to this, a, a real good one kind of in a minute. But this is pretty strong. You might not even have to play Marcin Pat Pratchett if you don't want to. If you, if you, if you don't just, if you just basically fade all these nine, these $9,400 fighters, like if instead of doing that, you played like, say, Volk. You know, and we'll get to some others in a minute. And don't play any other than nine Ks. Um, and just hope the salary savings that allow you to get to these, you know, make up for the lack of ceiling that you're not getting at the top of your lineups. Um, maybe this is a pretty decent way to play, actually. Um, we mentioned Simon uh, Mitchell is is just obviously just. His win odds are just too poor. We talked about the Pratchdale fight. We talked about the Tyra fight. We talked about the Crute fight. Talked about the Gomes fight as well. It's just her win odds are just not good enough, honestly. Talked about Jack D. His win odds are not good enough. So let's talk about some of these underdogs that that might have a shot. So let's let's start with Nico Price versus Robbie Lawler. So it's 8,900, 7,300. So, you know, once again... It's uh, the problem is, I mean, again, it's plus 210. I guess that's decent enough, right? Compared to some of these others, I mean, it's pretty decent, even though those his inside the distance line isn't great. I mean, to say the least, like plus five, eight, six hundred, whatever it is, that's terrible. I'd rather play Pratchnow, right? And I bet you Pratchnow is going to be a lot lower owned than Robbie Lawler just because of name value and all that stuff. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, but again, plus 200 on a card like this is certainly not bad. And then you have, well, you may as well look at the other side. It's a Nico Price. Uh, his inside the distance prop at 8,700 is, is not bad. I mean, minus 120, minus 110. Here's another one. Boy, oh boy, another mid-ranger. Let's, let's, let's put him in just to see what this looks like. I mean, this is, you can almost get away with this. And play like no almost no underdogs. You have to like make one punt to play like this. Uh, this is interesting. Um, but again, because because again, like you see Nico Price, and he, he normally to get you know an inside the distance probably minus one ten. That's good enough for ninety one hundred. But the problem is again is you're fighting with 
all these other 9,300 and ups that are just like more likely to get those 100, 110 points than you are, you know? But again, if you could build lineups up where you don't have to dumpster dive in those underdogs, I think this is this could be really interesting. Uh, anyway, um, I guess let's move on. We're gonna again, we'll we'll do it from fight number. Uh, it's a Laurel fight. We talked about uh, nickel. All right, Dan Hooker versus Jalen Turner. So 8,800, 7,400. A minus 250, minus 210. It's a very similar deal to the price fight, right? Let's see what the inside the distance lines are. Wow, look at this. Like Turner inside the distance, minus 140. Like these are just the, these are the, these are really, really good prices. Let's put it that way. You get away with not playing any of these guys? You get away with not playing any of the 9K and ups. I mean, you can, but remember, now you're going to need all of these guys to perform. You know, and, and Aguiar, is, listen, Aguiar doesn't really have the 120 that some of those top, top guys are. Serva doesn't have it as often. Rebovich doesn't really have the 120s, but, you know, got 100, 110 in them. Menafield, again, yeah, 100-ish. Turner, but again, you're, you're not having to dumpster dive in those 80 to 7200s to play like this. You only have to play one cheapo if you play this way. Um, now, we talked about uh, uh, Whitaker Duplessis. Again, Duplessis is fine. He's like plus 300, though, which is very unlikely he's going to win. But the two real underdogs, well, the one, the, the best play, I mean, on the slate, is just got to be Pantoja. Okay? He just has to be the best overall play on the slate because... He's got incredible win odds. That being, what is he? Only plus like 150. Compared to all these other underdogs, this is the best one. And, and he's got five rounds. So the thing is, we talk about opportunity costs. Like the opportunity costs of not getting one of these big, these decent underdogs with good win, win odds is extremely high. You know, and this, this is probably... Just the best play. Now, this is probably where I would eat the most chalk, if you want to know the truth. Because just to pay the 75 instead of the 7,200 for all those other Bow Wow plays, like the Duplessis and the Cratch Now, which we talked about, or the Lawler, which people are going to do, you know? Um, I mean, these, I don't know. I think that this is, I mean, compare like Ross to, say, Pantosia, you know? pantosha has got just as good win odds, and he's got five rounds upside and some finish upside also. Compare him to, to Rebovich, for example. You know, so I think Pantoja is the easy underdog play. And then the other one is, is Yair. You know, Yair in the main event. I mean, listen, we already talked about how Volk is going to be like the best looking 9K and up guy with all the take that upside. So Yair is probably going to get some good leverage against him. So I think if you are going to dumpster dive, I think that you should either go with the Yair or the ultra, ultra ridiculous Kratchnow play. Yair is going to be like 25% owned and Kratchnow is going to be like eight. Okay, that's the only difference. And for good reason. I mean, Yair's got five rounds to work with and he's, you know, probably a better play, I suppose, just raw. But um, that's, so that's what I would do. I mean, Pantoja, clearly the best underdog on the slate. Maybe you do a mid-range bill with Menafield and these guys. And if you are going to dumpster dive, like for me, oh, we didn't talk about Hooker, for example. Like, like Hooker, again, he's just he's let's see what his his odds were. I forgot about him. So he's a plus 210. I guess that's not terrible, but he's got name value. People will play him before they play Pratch now. I think I'd rather just play Pratch now if you want to know the truth. Um 
So that's pretty much my analysis. I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I'm probably not going to have much of Bo Nickel, probably not going to have much of those top guys. Um, not because they're bad plays. They're all incredible plays. But I think that 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 these these underdogs that you have the ability to play are just – their win odds are just brutal. And you're just going to be rooting for your top guys to score enough to, to allow you to, to get there with a loss. And that's just kind of usually a recipe for – that's kind of doomed, you know? Um, so that's where I'm at. I'll probably go mid-range builds. Fade, they'll fade all the top guys. And then with my punts, probably – you know, something like Pratchney Hour, yeah, year. And that's going to do it. Uh, good luck, everybody. I'm going to be back to do a betting breakdown either later tonight or tomorrow.